I would have privately preparing himself for the study of the word using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, it's important that we recognize that we are total products of your matchless grace. You have given to us logistical grace so that we may grow up spiritually, fulfill the purpose for which you have placed us in your plan. Help us to orient to these things. In Jesus' dear name, amen. A number of years ago when we had a split in our church, which as you may or may not know was over the policy, not a matter of doctrine or morals, it was just a policy matter. We had an exodus of people. A number of people were bad-mouthing me around town to some mutual acquaintances. Some of our people became rather distraught at this and actually told me that they, they were sure that God was going to get them for this. And they were waiting for their businesses to fail or something like that. Now, the tragedy is that those dear people in their zeal and their love for me fail to understand logistical grace. Now, it is true that a couple of the families went through some very grievous times of divorce, but that wasn't because they left us or because they bad-mouthed me. It was because they alienated themselves from Bible doctrine. That's the point. That's the reason that took place. It had nothing to do with that. Because, you see, God's logistical grace is not withheld because a person sins. No matter how badly they sin, now there is, and we'll be talking about it in a few moments, there is such a thing as disciplining grace. But when God disciplines, He disciplines in privacy. He doesn't do it generally so that the whole world knows all about it. It's, that's part of the grace principle of discipline. People are oriented to the fact that we earn or deserve, and so the emphasis is on performance. In his book, Transforming Greats, Jeff Bridges has an interesting illustration. He was the at the time of the writing, I don't know what he is anymore, but if he may still be executive vice president of the Navigators in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Let me quote from his chapter entitled The Performance Treadmill. Again, because we are legalistic by nature, says Jeff Bridges, we assume our performance in these areas earns God's blessing in our lives. I struggle with these legalistic tendencies even though I know better. Several years ago I was scheduled to speak at a large church on the West Coast. Arriving at the service, the church about 15 minutes before the Sunday morning service, I learned that one of the pastoral staff had died suddenly the night before. 
The staff and the congregation were in a state of shock and grief. Sizing up the situation, I realized my challenge to discipleship message I had prepared was totally inappropriate. The congregation needed comfort and encouragement, not challenge that day. I knew I needed a totally new message. So I silently began to pray, asking God to bring to my mind a message suitable for the occasion. Then I began to add up my merits and demerits for the day. Had I had my quiet time that morning? Had I entertained any lustful thoughts or told any half-truths? I had fallen into the performance trap. I quickly recognized what I was doing, so I said, Lord, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but none of them matters. I come to you today in the name of Jesus and by his merit alone ask for your help. A single verse of scripture came to my mind and with it a brief outline for a message I knew would be appropriate. I went to the pulpit and literally prepared the message as I spoke. God did answer prayer. Why did God answer my prayer? Was it because I had a quiet time that morning? or had fulfilled other spiritual disciplines? Was it because I hadn't entertained any sinful thoughts that day? No. God answered my prayer for only one reason. Jesus Christ had already purchased that answer to prayer 2,000 years ago on a Roman cross. God answers on the basis of His grace alone, not because of merits or demerits. That's exactly how we think, though. If there is any difficulty that comes into our lives, we don't think grace. We start to think of all of the areas that I might have failed the Lord. And while we should check out sins, we fail to do it. Just like most of us, uh, what's the first thing that would come to your mind if you would receive a telegram? I wonder what terrible thing happened to somebody. That's the first thing. You don't think... Oh boy, this is the notification that I just won the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. You never think that way. Think the other way. We always think in the negative situation. And if you're, if you're going for a new job interview, the first thing, you, you're so careful to, to watch, you know, check out every step, make sure that there's no, that I better have my quiet time or I better... I better not have any mental attitude sins that I have that I look with lust upon. If you're in a, undergoing surgery, you think to yourself, oh, I better be prepared. I don't want... In other words, we don't think grace. We don't think a logistical grace. Think, boy, I, would, uh, I'm, I know I missed Bible class and I, if, I didn't have a good reason. Gee, I wonder if the Lord's going to hold it against me. That's not grace, folks. That's merit. That's performance. But we're so oriented to it that we are consistently checking up our performance when we have a real challenge that is before us. Now, this doesn't mean that we should ever take a lackadaisical attitude towards sin, mental attitude sins, things like that. All of these are part of, of our life that we should avoid. But I'm, I am saying that it is imperative that we start to read think this whole process about logistical grace. And it doesn't help because we read articles by other Christians and great Christian leaders and who are so worried over the sin question. Now, again, we're not saying that we sin with impunity. We'll deal with that in a moment. But the point is that grace 
does, the logistical grace has nothing to do with whether we sin or whether we don't sin. Whether we're in fellowship or out of fellowship. Logistical grace is the sovereign grace of God that is provided for every believer regardless of how he lives. There are several passages, and I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to a couple of them uh, so that we can uh, mark them in our Bibles. At the same time, note them. John chapter 1 has two tremendous verses that help us to understand and orient to logistical grace. John chapter 1, verse 17, tells us that the law was given through Moses, but grace and doctrine came through Jesus Christ. And then verse 16, which precedes it actually, tells us how it works. For it says, For from the fullness of His grace we have all received one blessing after another. That's in New International, and tragically, that is a terrible, terrible translation. That does despot to translation. That is, uh, it, it may be the dynamic, but it should be a little closer to the original. We have a, a, a key word here. Uh, the first part is that because... From his fullness, the play role, oh, we've, that's the, uh, the uh, word for fullness, overflowing. We have all received, then we have charis twice. Be, between it, we have the preposition anti, A-N-T-I. Now, anti has a number of meanings. Uh, it can mean against, and we often think of it in that term, but many times it means instead of. For example, the Antichrist may be against Christ, but the major emphasis of the Antichrist is he is the one who is instead of Christ. So, what this verse is saying is grace instead of grace. Others have translated uh, grace in place of, and that's, that's legitimate. Grace in place of grace. And uh, uh, there have been some who have translated it uh, grace heaped upon grace. Grace added to grace. I don't think that the heaped upon is uh, legitimate as far as the use of the Greek word, though it may be true as far as the application. But it isn't legitimate to translate grace as blessing because the grace policy of God is one fantastic blessing all the time. God doesn't dole out His blessings one at a time. God is pouring out His blessing all the time. What He's talking about, however, is grace upon grace is this, that added to saving grace is living grace. Added to logistical grace is disciplining grace. Added to disciplining grace is Super grace. God is always adding to or uh, giving grace in place of grace. Grace instead of grace. He's pouring grace all the time. And this is totally unrelated, remember, to any merit of any kind. Now, there are, there are many places where we read, uh, and most of the epistles, when Paul writes to them, he, he starts off with grace to you becomes uh, simply a, a greeting. And grace and peace are, 
are mixed together, but they are most of the time simply uh, a greeting, and they don't really communicate. But if you turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes, As fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Well, now what does that mean? Well, we have a prepositional phrase in the Greek, eis kenos. Eis is the preposition of motion, meaning toward rather than in, and kenos is without purpose. Toward no purpose. So he is saying, we urge you not to receive the grace of God toward no purpose. This is God's way of, uh, of saying that to, to abuse the grace of God. Or, and how do you abuse the grace of God? To fail to use it. Failure to exploit the grace of God is to receive the grace of God to no purpose. Failure to... You cannot, you can never, ever exploit grace to the full. I know our holiness friends don't understand that. They always think, well, they're afraid of, of using too much grace. It's impossible. The bank of heaven can never be bankrupt as far as grace is concerned. That grace will flow and flow and flow, and the more you take, the more there is. The more you use grace, the more grace there is available. Now, you can fail to use it, to fail to exploit it, fail to, be, to draw on that grace. No believer who has ever thrust himself on the grace of God has ever been disappointed by the grace of God. Now, you can throw yourself on the uh, mercy of a human being, and you may use it up. Finally, he'll say, oh, I've had enough. I've given and I've given, and I've given, and I've given. Now I draw the line. That's it. But as Annie Johnson Flint says, he giveth, and giveth, and giveth again. When Peter said to the Lord, Lord, how many times shall we forgive that brother who sins against us? Till seven times? That sounds logical. Seven's the perfect number, the complete number. Seven would be a complete... That would be completely forgiving him. But see, forgiveness is based on grace. And therefore, the Lord says, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. In other words, 490 times. No, 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 no. An idiom meaning an infinite number of times. There is no way that you can ever possibly take and use grace up. Another term he uses, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God. Now, 
both of our translators uh, translate it um, as uh, uh, oppose the grace of God. But the principle is, uh, it is, the matter is, uh, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Righteousness and blessing come through grace. Legalism can't stand grace, and grace is the basis for our eternal security. The reason legalism hates eternal security so much is that one is restored to fellowship by acknowledging one's sins, which is grace all the way, and we do not nullify the grace of God uh, uh, by means of, uh, of, of utilizing the grace of God in the forgiveness of sins. Again and again, we are. it is important that we nullify the grace of God simply by failing to exploit it or to fail to use it or to slip into legalism of some sort. Any time you slip into legalism, you nullify the grace of God. Or the grace of God is toward nothingness, toward without purpose. There are a couple of other uh, words which uh, uh, are used uh, in, in Scripture. Uh, we find it uh, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we find it in a couple of other places. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we can drift past the grace of God. Uh, there are many things that we can do, but the, what the important thing is that we cannot ever draw too much on the grace of God. Turn to James chapter 4. And we're, this sets us up for our, uh, not the next increment, but the one following it. But uh, in James chapter 4, we have a statement which is made by James to believers. Believers who are called here adulteresses. King James says you adulterers and adulteresses, but really it's only the, the feminine uh, adulteresses. An adulteress, of course, is one who has leg illegitimate sex, obviously, uh, and the one who is responding. And he, here we have the believers who are likened to uh, adulteress and adulteress. And what, what is the basis of it? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's not correct. Friendship is not the correct word. This is the word. P-H-I-L-I-A. Philia, which comes from philos, which comes from phileo, and philos is total soul love. For what? The cosmos diabolicus, the world system. Here's a believer who has a total soul love for the world system. What is it? The, the, he says then the analogy is that this is actually enmity, ekthros. E-C-H-T-H-R-O-S. And that is to to make oneself an enemy, an enemy of God, whoever therefore, and then we have this word, bulamai. Bulamai is a strong determination which comes from the settled thinking. It's not an emotional term. Thelo, thelo is the emotional term. This is a deep, settled conviction. Okay, here is what uh, this person does. They resolve. Uh, this is translated the determinate counsel of God uh, when it talks about in the book of Acts, the, the, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a determined, settled decision which is made. So the believer who determines in his own soul to have a total soul love, not to be a friend, but a total soul love of the world, then we have uh, this word. K-A-T-H 
I-S-T-E-M-I. Compound word kata plus istemi. But this is to con he constitutes uh, himself. He he makes himself. He sets himself. He constitutes himself an enemy of God. You make yourself an enemy of God. God doesn't make you the enemy, but if you determine in your soul to be a friend of this world system, then you constitute yourself an enemy of God. Then, appealing to the Old Testament Scripture, he says this, Or do you think in vain that the Scripture says? Or do you think to no purpose? Or again, we have kenos. Do you think to no purpose? Uh, that the scripture says now the scripture that he's quoting is not found right after it in the in the sentence the scripture that he's talking about is found later on it's found in uh, uh, the middle of verse 6 where it says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the scripture that he's talking about. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. So do you think that the scripture says, without purpose, God resists the proud or the arrogant, but gives grace to the humble? Now, between this, we have a parenthesis that Paul, uh, the, pardon me, that James uh, places here. A parenthesis that is only brought out by the syntax. So, if you have the sentence, do you, and uh, think isn't even a good word, do you uh, assume or presume that the Scripture says, to no purpose, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble? Right in the middle of this, he says this, The Spirit deeply loves, referring to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit deeply loves, which is the word for epipotheo. I mean, the translation of epipotheo. The Holy Spirit deeply loves Now, since he deeply loves, he does something. He gives greater grace. Now, the word for greater is the superlative of my zona. Looks like this. M E I Z O and a my zona now you have you have comparative adverbs you have superlative adverbs you have and the, the same adverb can be the same can be either comparative or superlative depending upon how it is used in this case it is the superlative of my zona which is better see if it were com if it were uh, comparative it would be the he gives greater grace but in the superlative he gives Super abundant grace, you could say, or super grace. So, the Holy Spirit deeply loves and gives super grace. This is something that uh, God pours out over and above logistical grace. It's something that is tremendously greater. Um, if you will, let's see what our time is. Um, in uh, let's see if I can find it here very quickly. I was looking for something that I hadn't planned on talking to you about at this point, but um, well, I can't. I have it in another place, and I'm going to get to it eventually. But I just wanted to point out at this point that. Uh, there is a special grace which is reserved beyond, over and above this principle of uh, the grace of uh, logistical grace. Logistical grace 
is a part of what God has for each and every believer. And above and beyond, pardon me, logistical grace, there are two other graces. One is called disciplining grace, and the other is, as I pointed out, super grace. Now, disciplining grace deals with one of the great problems that is faced. There are three problems which God faces as far as our temporal fellowship with Him is concerned. One is post-salvation sinning. What does God do about post-salvation sinning? The second thing is, what does He do about ignorance of Bible doctrine? And the third thing he is he does, what do we what does he do, for a problem he faces? What do we do? Uh, what does he do about failure on the part of the believer to apply the doctrine that he knows? All of these have to be solved by grace. Let's deal first of all with post salvation sinning, and so we we have the second major area of the living grace, and that is disciplining grace. Now, what is the problem that is faced by the, the believer in, under disciplining grace? Well, we have all kinds of things uh, that have to be dealt with. First of all is the problem of involvement with the world system. Well, the cosmic system, the cosmos diabolicus, the world system under the control of Satan. Secondly, carnality. Carnality is when the believer is controlled by his old sin nature rather than controlled by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly is the problem which is related to this, and that is the perpetuation of carnality into reversionism. Fourthly is the problem of implosion and explosion, or the fragmentation of the soul. And all of these really are involved with one, one principle, and that is the restraint of sin in the believer's life. How does God restrain sin in the believer's life? Well, we have, therefore, the principle of disciplining grace, which is simply this. Disciplining grace is uh, the, uh, the intervention of God into the sinning believer's life For the purpose of correction. Now God will is so gracious. God is so gracious. He does it in different ways. See, first of all, He does it by means of precept or by means of Bible teaching. The Word of God is alive and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, critic of the thoughts and intent of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. You see, God wants to reprove sin in your life for correction, as well as for instruction in righteousness. 
This tells us that God reproves us, corrects us, and then tells us the way we should go. So this is by precept, we say. We use the word precept. Simply that is, by means of Bible teaching, he seeks to restrain sin in your life. He seeks to intervene in your life. You're heading in a certain way, and the Bible teaching comes along, and you respond, positive volition, and uh, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit, you actually have a change in the direction that your life is taking. This is the way God prefers to do it. That's the way we parents prefer to do it. We, tr we prefer, much prefer, to be able to tell our child what to do, and hopefully the kid will be smart enough to say, well, my parents have enough experience, my parents have enough knowledge, my parents have enough uh, uh, on me that maybe I should listen to them. That would be the choice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, however, that doesn't always work that way. In arrogance, we often say to ourselves, hmm, what do they know? They've never been here. They've never been children. My parents were born adults. Obviously. They don't know. They've never had this temptation that I have. My, my uh, father never had all these women falling at his feet. Couldn't be. He's too ugly or something like that. My mother never had all these boys calling on the phone. Well, you don't know. You see, she keeps a few secrets from you. But anyway, the point is, we know better than they. And so we're, we set apart... We set out to do it our own way, you see. But when precept fails, God intervenes in our lives. And he remember, he's doing it in love. He's doing it in grace. You haven't earned it or deserved this. But God is, is, is intervening. And he intervenes in the two basic stages of discipline. And if you'll turn, please, to Hebrews chapter 12, we'll look at one of them, uh, at both of them here, and then we'll look at another, one other passage in which we find okay, this given to us. In Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, we have a strong statement that is made by our Lord. Verse 4, he says, through the writer of Hebrews, in your struggle against sin, there we have this, 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 this constant struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, we have here to resist until blood. That's really what the original says. This is an idiom. God doesn't expect you to shed your blood in resisting sin. That's not what he's talking about. Resisting to blood is, is the way of saying your utmost. You know, uh, when, you're, when, you give, uh, when you give of your blood in, uh, in some kind of service, you've given the most that you can give. You give your life. And so the point is, you're giving him utmost. Oswald Chambers has written a book called My uh, uh, Utmost for His Highest in which the premise is that, and here are devotionals that the believer can use, just been recently been updated into modern English, it was, has been the best seller, it has been the number one best seller for years and years and years and years. My utmost for his highest. Uh, in other words, uh, the idea is I, uh, what I am willing to, to, to do in order to get the most from God. Tragic to me. Because it's, while there are some fantastic principles in there, the idea is this, the more I give to God, the more I'll get, which nullifies grace. The more you give should be on the basis of an entirely different motivation. Love. Not to get. You don't have to give your utmost to get the best or the most from God. You get the most from God on the basis of His grace and His grace alone. But the point is, to resist 
uh, unto blood is to is to resist sin. Now, how does how do you resist sin? Well, he describes it in Romans chapter thirteen, verse fourteen, where he says, "Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh." The flesh is the old sin nature to take control. Make no provision for the old sin nature. I had a pastor friend who, uh, when he went to, to college, he took, uh, he studied uh, uh, as his minor uh, education. And the idea was, in case I fail in the ministry, I can always fall back on being, becoming a teacher. And I just said one time, just joking, I said, why do you make provision for failure? If God's provided for you the spiritual gift and you're prepared, you just don't make provision for failure. You just go and make provision for success. And success doesn't mean how big a church or how many people you have. It's fulfilling the plan of God for your life. And he's been in the ministry now all these years. He's never, ever gone back to teaching school, which is fun. But see, believers do make provision for the flesh to fulfill it in the lusts thereof. The guy who has problem with pornography, who uh, who buys uh, uh, a Playboy magazine on, on the sly. Uh, the uh, uh, the person who has uh, a problem with alcohol, uh, who uh, buys uh, had a call for his cold, <laughs> just medicinal, you know. Uh, the person who has a problem with with uh, tobacco, who who uh, just has uh, uh, smoke once in a while. No, no, no. You, you make provision for the flesh. Uh, I told a story of a young man who, uh, years and years ago, one of the teenagers, uh, he, he got saved and uh, he burned his cigarettes on the front steps of the church. And a few weeks later, of course, everybody smelled. You, uh, the people who use it think nobody knows but them, but they, you don't realize that they stink to high heaven. Uh, and uh, we could smell it on them again. And it was... It's, it's up to him. It wasn't up to us. But uh, I asked him, I said, uh, Don, what, uh, I thought you, you gave up smoking. He said, it was easy. He said, I had ten, pack, ten cartons at home in the drawer. He made provision for the flesh. In case I can't hold out, I'm, I got ten. Well, of course you can't hold out if you got ten cartons at home waiting for you. Make provision for the flesh. That's not resisting sin. That is making provision to fail. That is making provision to go back to it again. So I'm not going to sell off. I'm not going to uh, get rid of all these things. We were watching uh, the other evening the 700 Club, and on it was a young man who was an addict to uh, uh, rock music. And uh, he had, you remember the figure? Uh, uh, how many? Uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, $20,000 worth of of uh, rock records by uh, the the every not just one or two but every record that Ozzy uh, Osbourne came out with every record that they came and he put them in a big pile and he had whole movies of them and he he put a torch to burn every single one of them he didn't keep two or three underneath that are uh, that would be uh, uh, the provision for the flood every one of them and then he came on and, and told about why he couldn't he couldn't have anything to do with it what it meant to him. The same program had a, a, a singer who had made a, a millions of dollars as a member of a number of those groups, and he had to totally uh, cut himself off. He couldn't just cut down to one group. You can't just do that. You've got there. You must not have any of this. Well, Hebrews twelve four says. Uh, oh, our time is gone. Almost. Let me quickly hurry up in the final moment. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the uttermost. You have you've made provision for the flesh. Verse 5. And you have forgotten. You have forgotten that word of exhortation. This is the exhortation that comes, parakaleo, which is the word of correction, you see. The word of correction which has come to you. Uh, and what is it? And that is that God deals with you as sons when he says this. And then he quotes 
from the third, per, uh, third chapter of Proverbs, verses 11 and 12, to my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not... So first of their two attitudes, do not make light of it, but that's not that's the first one. And do not lose heart. Do not become discouraged when you are disciplined. Two attitudes. Don't make light of it. Don't be discouraged by it. When the Lord rebukes you, when the Lord corrects you, when you go through a divine discipline. Don't laugh it off and say it isn't important. And don't become discouraged because you become so trodden down because God is spanking you so hard. But ver ver please notice, because, verse 6, wh whom the Lord loves, He disciplines and He scourges or skins alive with a lip, with a whip. Every son whom he receives. There are the two stages. The first stage is his uh, uh, discipline. The second is scourging or the skinning alive. This is just ordinary, normal discipline. This is intensified discipline. So it's normal discipline and intensified discipline. This is the, the, uh, uh, the stuff that comes along that God says, wake up. You're heading in the wrong direction. Pay attention. And you don't pay attention, then you've got to get into the intensified discipline. We'll get into that in our next study very briefly and move on through the doctrine of grace. We invite those who are listening to or write or watching to write for the booklet entitled Grace, God's Middle Name. It's absolutely free of charge. Nobody will call on you and you'll not be done for any kind of support. We print them as the money is available, therefore it's all paid for, or you wouldn't get it. <laughs> but write for us, the address will be coming on the screen very shortly and at the close of the broadcast. Now let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that it was demonstrated on the cross when He died for our sins, that He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Thank you that you provide logistical grace for us, and we do thank you, too, that you do spank us. You do correct us when we're heading in the wrong direction. But you don't do it in vindictiveness. You don't do it in anger. You do it because you continue to love us and are tender toward us and want us to live the life that exploits your grace to the full and enjoys this life to the maximum. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.